Now, the middle way, um, the immigrant and refugee debate to 2021 here on the middle way. And we have our uh, regular co-host contributor, Chang Wang, and Alexander Morawa. Morawa, I get that right. Um, and um, we, we, uh, both of whom have been on many shows here on the middle way. And, and um, today we're going to talk about the immigrant and refugee debate. And I want to want to read a phrase, though, if I may. <clears throat> this, to me, for a long time in my life, and maybe for others, defined the beacon of the United States. And I can't help but having an emotional reaction to it. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Emma Lazarus, it's on the base of the Statue of Liberty, November 2nd, 1883. And it has uh, stood as a beacon for many tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people who joined the country um, then and thereafter. And it has spoken to the world of uh, a policy uh, that defined, defined until maybe now the United States. So welcome to the show, Chang and Alexander. Let's talk about American policy for immigration today. Chang, why don't you define the scope of the discussion as you see it? And why don't you introduce Alexander? Of course. Uh, first, let me introduce Alexander. He doesn't really need my introduction. He's, uh, uh, he's uh, been a frequent uh, guest on the program. But Alexander is, uh, most importantly, he's a, a dual citizen of Austria and the United States. He's a law professor, has been teaching in Switzerland, in China, in Brazil any other countries. And he is also a practicing attorney and uh, practicing international human rights law and international law uh, with my uh, form. And we are, uh, I'm very honored to get to know Alexander more than a decade ago. And through the, uh, all these years, I learned a lot from him, particularly international uh, law questions. And we have co-authored an article for BBC about immigration and about that was under Donald Trump. And we talk about the uh, is the United States a nation of Im still a nation of immigrants because this term from JFK, JFK published book called a nation of immigrants defined the United States as a nation of immigrants built by uh, immigrants and the consist of immigrants. Uh, but recently under the, our new president, President Biden, the immigration and the refugee issue just become uh, debated again. So you mentioned the uh, Haitian refugees and asylum seekers under the bridge in the southern border. And, uh, and also uh, during our previous discussion, uh, we, we talked about a xenophobia. And there's a University of Minnesota law professor argued that instead of United States as nation of immigrants, we are more of a nation of xenophobia. <laughs> so I'm not entirely sure that I agree with the professor, but I think that is a good topic for all of us to discuss. Last but not least, we supposed to have another guest today, Justice Paul Anderson will also Pre previously on the show, and he's traveling, so he has a little bit technical difficulty to be connected to our Zoom meeting. So we will see whether or not he can join us momentarily. But I'm going to uh, leave this to uh, Alexander to hear his insights and comments. Where are we, Alexander? You know, from the time of Emma Lazarus, how did we get to this mean-spirited place? Well, that's um, a massive tour of history, long past, history recent, and considerations of the future. I think we have to 
always be careful when we come up with two sweeping judgments. I think we have to be cautious because our emotions, and I understand immigration is an emotional debate. My family is, uh, has um, multiple backgrounds of uh, both migration and fleeing countries for persecution. My wife actually was a child refugee from Vietnam. So this is an emotional topic, but emotional topics should not allow us to give us bleak, blunt, brutal, emotional, uh, in, uh, emotionally influenced answers to questions that are actually um, require thorough research and analysis and, and, and a look at what's really going on and, and whether we are still a nation of immigrants or a nation of xenophobia. Do you agree with me that we've turned? Do you agree with me that we've turned to a more mir um, mean-spirited approach to immigration? We certainly are less welcoming as a nation. I think it's a global phenomenon. If you look at parallel developments in Europe, that is a similar phenomenon. Uh, many times, mass influx of migrants and refugees um, causes communities to become more inward-looking, more exclusive, more using the term that sociologists are using, othering, trying to find the difference between them and everybody else more quickly, and then jumping to conclusions and saying, in order to remain safe, we have to exclude whatever is different. But let me give you a very practical example. My children go to school in what it usually makes it to the list of the top 10 conservative cities in the United States, Mesa, Arizona. Uh, very large uh, Mormon communities there. If you look at the community of her students, their students, it is actually the archetypical melting pot of the United States. There is a representation of every single race, every single nation, every single background. Uh, in um, you know, a hot spot of conservatism. So we are de facto a melting pot in the nation of immigrants, but are we still living up to the promises that you read from the Statue of Liberty there? I'm more concerned with them, we might not. Well, so we talked before the show about how Trump had uh, um, exacerbated a, a xenophobia in this country. And, you know, we know it, it didn't start with him, but he certainly aggravated it. Um, and um, by the end of his administration, I think there were a lot of mm, progressive liberal people that wanted to see uh, Trump's policies rolled back, especially with the Department of Homeland Security, which had been implementing his, his new xenophobia. Um, but, but that hasn't really happened. Uh, we talked about that before the show, too, and that President Joe Biden is in there, and one would expect that his, you know, more liberal approach to that and everything else uh, would prevail and that the Department of Homeland Security would be reformed to exclude uh, the policies that Trump had initiated. So <clears throat> that hasn't happened. And my question to you is, why hasn't that happened? Wouldn't, wouldn't you expect, didn't you expect, and, and didn't Chang expect that, that these um, mean-spirited, in my view, mean-spirited policies would be rolled back, but it hasn't happened. And, and these people from Latin America and Haiti, they're under a bridge, which seems very dehumanizing at the least. Why hasn't it happened? Well, well, let absolutely. me um, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 go, ahead. go ahead, Tom. Let me just point out one thing. Uh, during Trump administration, the mission statement of United States Citizenship and Immigration Services was changed, was changed by a Trump appointee, and basically eliminated the statement that the United States is a nation of immigration immigrants that uh, was deleted. Second major change of that mission statement was UICIS was defined as a service in agency, a government agency provide service. But the new mission statement basically redefined the UICIS, the government agency as not providing service to immigrants, but rather to maintain, manage, and control the lawful immigration process of the nation. So obviously we can understand why there's such a change because 
that the previous administration have a special soft spot of uh, lawful immigration versus illegal immigration. But that was a completely reversal of decades long agency history and practice. And the same, not only this, and according to the Immigration uh, Lawyers Association, uh, to their calculation, there are at least 1,000 immigration related policy had been changed since Trump took office. So for the past year, four years, very fast speed, very effective, very efficient. They changed more than 1,000 immigration related policy, uh, big or small. Now, the question back to Jay's original question was why we can't just revert back to normal. It's not, it's, it's, it's quite, seems very simple. Is if you broke with the president and you change the policy arbitrarily and capriciously, it is almost an obligation for your successor to correct a path wrong. But we have not seen, you know, very few of them have been reversed, but most of policy change stay. So that is quite a surprise and to, uh, you know, many pundits and immigration uh, lawyers, and we just simply quite understand why this, some of the uh, difficult, policy, difficult policy just stays. I think uh, Justice Anderson just dial in, and perhaps we can... I think I'm, I'm can you wonderful. hear me? Yes, we can hear you, just, Justice. How good to you have you You won't have any, uh, any video, but you have my audio. Oh, yes. we have we have your photographs. So welcome back, yep. welcome to the show. Uh, we were and we were talking just briefly about uh, why the uh, Biden administration has not or has not been able to reverse uh, some of the um, xenophobic um, changes that uh, Donald Trump made uh, in immigration. And uh, we were about to talk to uh, Alexander Morawa about. Uh, you know, uh, that essential question, why hasn't that happened? This is obviously bad for the country. It's bad for the image of the country. It's bad for the, the whole notion of being a beacon for liberty and being a nation of immigrants in John Kennedy's words. Uh, it's bad for our image overseas. It's bad for our image of ourselves. Uh, and yet Joe Biden hasn't fixed it. Why, Alexander? Why? Can I ask you that? You're asking Biden to do the impossible. You're asking him to turn back centuries of uh, xenophobic attitude. You know, Trump has just revealed the uh, lesser qualities of the American nature. So I think that's putting too much of a burden on uh, Biden. So I'll now step back and get a response to that. <laughs> Alexander? Well, Justice Anderson, you made my job just a lot easier because you probably you, you put your thumb exactly on the problem. It's not a you know breaking point between one administration and the other. It is a, a centuries of development in immigration that happens in waves and, and changes with attitudes and changes also with the way we talk about immigration. And, and given the fact that now we talk about immigration not in, in lengthy uh, treatises and thought out uh, discussions, but in tweets. And other short messages that cannot, you know, uh, that do not lend themselves to sophisticated discussion. We hear much more of the one-sided, uh, xenophobic, and othering approach that um, definitely defines that. So I think it's not the Biden problem. I, I agree. I mean, Biden should probably be more proactive in this respect. Uh, also, you know, up front, I'm sure there's changes to practices behind the doors that we don't see. There's um, minute changes to what actually happens in, in individual cases. But it should be a little bit more upfront, should be a little bit more radical, if you will. Uh, the other problem is it's easier to come up with uh, um, policies that are not so legally sound, like the Burgess administration does. Then to come up with reversal policies that actually have to make sense uh, and have to have to, uh, stand in the judicial challenge, possibly ultimately. Any of those policies can be challenged, not just by pro-immigrant uh, uh, agents, but also by 
agents that will want to curtail and, and limit immigration. And they also still have to be on solid ground in this respect. Well, Judge Anderson, you know, your comment is provocative to me and suggests that, um, well, we have, a, we have a divided country on so many things, uh, not, not too far from half-half. And um, it sounds like uh, we have had, and uh, Trump exacerbated this division on immigration policy. Uh, and um, now, you know, Biden steps in and he finds the same division. He finds half the country would like to be xenophobic. Um, this, this creates a, a problem. Do you agree with me about the division? Is that part of your approach to this, your view of it? Uh, I'm going to say is that a large segment of the population of the United States has been xenophobic for a long time. And I said that uh, what happens with Trump, he's enabled and encouraged the, uh, the, how should I say, the lesser angels of our nature and has permitted that uh, uh, nasty part of the xenophobic attitude to come to the fore. And those are the people who are speaking now. I mean, I think we can uh, do something to overcome that, but it's, uh, it, it's going to be very hard because it's so ingrained in the American nature. You know, to uh, dislike or be uh, prejudiced with respect to people who are different from different countries. Well, it's, it's, uh, not, a great, it's not a grain of the people that, um, you know, are, that I know, that are people are in Hawaii, the people who are largely immigrants. Uh, uh, I suppose that the natural tendency of an immigrant, somebody who identifies his family's roots as a immigrant roots, um, is going to favor a more humane policy. And so assuming that division that I mentioned, uh, why, wouldn't, um, why wouldn't Biden do that? Isn't he risking losing uh, the people who have supported him in his, uh, uh, you know, his progressive approach? Okay, what do you think about that? Uh, is this a mistake as far as Biden's policy is concerned? I, d I wouldn't call it a mistake. And uh, he, the, the, the administration is probably too busy with so many things on their plate. But uh, I think it's very, uh, under the current political environment and international relations, it's, it's just uh, almost impossible to, to tackle the immigration and refugee issues in the right way, if, we, if you may. And there's one thing I do want to mention. And uh, we we do have a uh, immigration uh, immigrants and refugee, both in our program title. So the refugee is a very interesting word, and because once people have been labeled as refugee, and and the individual immediately assume a new identity, and the previous identity simply evaporate, like if even your professor, a lawyer, scientist. Doctor, it doesn't matter, you are now just a refugee. And then we become easily become other and we versus other, uh, othering other people. But uh, look at the climate change, look at what happened in Louisiana, in Texas, in, in not only uh, other parts of the world, but also in our own country. Anybody can become a refugee overnight. You can become a, you know, because a, a, a storm uh, can, can, can make hundreds of people refugee. And if there's a, a, a large natural disaster, you know, half a million people can become refugee overnight. So we have to, uh, I think worth matters. If we keep telling these people seeking a better life, seeking or fundamental basic shelter and protection, just label them a refugee. We have, we are wrong on uh, impossible, we have an impossible- well, I wonder about that. that. Alexander, what do you think? Is the United States big enough? Is the United States flexible enough uh, to accept refugees from wherever source? Why can't we be the home for refugees around the world? We have lots of geography. We have lots of, you know, until now, we've had lots of institutions and kindness that can absorb them? Why don't we just say yes? Why don't we do that? 
You know, we have a tradition, and I think we can. Now, let me go back briefly to what uh, Jen was actually talking about. But it's crucial. It's sort of the foundation of when we're talking about refugee. What is a refugee? We're operating on a legal system that was created after World War II. And that system understood the refugee to be a person persecuted by a government for a political opinion. Right, so all the people that Jen was listing, the people fleeing natural disasters, climate change, uh, violence from non-state actors, and so on, were not initially part of the definition of refugee. Nowadays, we still have a few traditional refugees, but the majority of people are fleeing things that are different than we had in the 1940s and 1950s. The mentality has changed, the mindset has changed, the law has not always changed. Uh, I remember the instance of uh, female genital mutilation, for instance, which was a big debate in the 1980s and 1990s. It took until then to realize that women can actually be refugees because a private person mutilates her body. The government has nothing to do with that. It was the courts that ultimately stepped in in multiple jurisdictions that expanded the notion of refugee. So I think we need to adjust our understanding of refugee a little bit to get back to a notion where we can all say these are people who deserve shelter. And I think if we call it that rather than refugee, we might have a larger population actually agree with the need to help people instead of uh, you know um, lending our sovereign nation to people who come in for whatever malevolent purpose, which is poor of the debate of migration right now. We're dealing with the classic political refugee, but the world is changing. We have climate refugees, we have economic refugees, and it's, uh, you know, we, we it, it's, there's a lot of sub uh, groups to this whole uh, uh, group that's called refugees. They're not immigrants in the true sense because they're coming here escaping something and climate change, it's uh, economics and it's political. Uh, uh, Chang, you know, uh, it, there's a program that's playing on MSNBC now um, about um, Afghanistan, the, the graveyard of empires, let's call it. And it's done by a reporter called Richard Engel. And he talks about something we all know about. He, he talks about the fact that there were hundreds of thousands of translators and um, people who helped the United States in the course of the 20 year war in Afghanistan and how much trouble uh, they had with the State Department in terms of getting papers to come to the United States, not just in the last two or three weeks, but over months, even years. And the United States policy under Trump was was really denying them, um, generally speaking, denying them their rights uh, as uh, uh, those who um, could prove that they had helped the United States and were promised um, uh, visas. Um, and I mean, that's, that's very problematic uh, in the sense of, um, you know, the American image as a welcher on the promises. Uh, where, where does that fit? It, 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 there, was, there was, I don't think there was a change in policy it was a change in the speed of Trump's agencies in processing these requests and ap applications. You can deny something uh, simply by delaying it. We all know that. Um, what about that kind of uh, um, what kind of um, I don't know de facto policy? Uh, what can we? What can we? What should we do about that? I want to hear Justice Anderson's comments on this. I really, I really do. Judge, what's your comments on this? Uh, very different from the Haitian refugees, the uh, Mexican refugees. Uh, the, the moral core of who we are as a country was really compromised in Afghanistan. Uh, I won't go there, but we have a moral obligation with those people and uh, from Afghanistan who helped us and put their uh, uh, lives on the line. The same way with respect to Hmong, who uh, we have a number of in Minnesota. Uh, we, we have a world-class moral obligation to do everything we can help. Yep, good. Well, okay, let me, let me go to Alexander with, you know, advancing this discussion to 
what can be done. Let's assume, let's assume that Joe Biden decides he wants to satisfy the progressive element in the country, that he's not interested in advancing or perpetuating xenophobia, um, and he wants to liberalize or maybe I should say return immigration refugee policy to a more liberal time. How could he do that? And what, uh, what steps should he take substantively uh, to do that now? I would personally advise the president, and I'm, I'm sure as uh, his advisors probably talk about similar points, to connect two dots that have been disconnected. The refugee problem, the fact that people fleeing countries because they're being persecuted, and the fact that we actually as an immigrant nation need highly qualified immigrants today as much as we needed them in 1902. So if you link those two, it's pretty easy. Refugees usually are individuals who are highly educated, very smart, and therefore have a political opinion, right? That's why people are being persecuted. Why are people being persecuted in Afghanistan right now? There's a group of interpreters and aides and, and military assistants, of course, and, and I agree with Justice Anderson, we have a definitive obligation to that group. But then look at beyond that, it will be educators, it will be women, and it will be minorities in Afghanistan and will be the large group of people who have a legitimate claim to actually become a refugee. Uh, what's the common factor between all these groups? I would say we actually want them, right? They would be extremely well uh, adjustable and very, very valuable additions to the population of the United States. That's still second best. I think with the, if you look at the global angle, but with the best solution would be if they would stay in Afghanistan and have a say in what the future of the country is. With the Taliban, the question is uh, pretty much answered at this point in time that women will not have a standing, they will, have, will not have a role in education, they will not have a role beyond the household. They'll go back to medieval understandings of what women are. So women, by definition, are victims of that regime there. And specifically those who stood out as leaders in the past 20 years, who you know took up the challenge and said, we will become judges, we will become university professors, we will become police women. One of the first stories was about a, a policewoman being executed by the Taliban, apparently, yeah. simply because she was a policewoman. Um, Judge, I want to I want to take a question that I asked uh, Alexander earlier to um, a, another level, and that is this: I mean, you could say the United States has the resources; it has the, I don't want to say history, but it, it has the capability. Of, um, of bringing in all kinds of immigrants and refugees into the country and finding a place for them and making them part of a, perhaps a, a more vigorous economy right now. Um, and, and you could look at Afghanistan and say, gee, there's a, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who consider that, who, who, were, who were exposed to um, a, a more liberal life in the past 20 years and don't like the return of the Taliban at all. They're afraid and they would like to leave. And, they, and you know, to some extent they are leaving. And many have gone to Pakistan. In fact, Pakistan has now sh shut the border. Um, many would like to leave Afghanistan. You could, you could empty out Afghanistan right now if you could give them a pass. And so the question is, you know, we have a lot of failed countries, not exactly like Afghanistan, but in the same genre of countries that really don't serve their citizens, where people would like to leave. And if and the Statue of Liberty, you know, and the nation of immigrants concept around the United States pervades, you know, we would like to take them. But if you do that, if you empty out Afghanistan and other failed nations, and you bring them all to our shores, What's what's the global effect? How do you deal with a failed country? You just take its citizens in? It doesn't sound like it will work over the long term for either side of the equation. What do you think? I think you're right on. Uh, we got to do the doable. And uh, I mean, I, I mean, I go back earlier. I mean, we should win in uh, Afghanistan. We have the most powerful military in the world. And we can't because it was beyond our capability. We got to figure out. I mean, immigrants enrich this country so much. I've been involved in so many different immigrant things, and they do bring good aspects of their culture. But uh, 
you know, it can, if we try to solve all the problems of failed nations, it could take us to the breaking point, and that really does worry me. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, Chang, let's let's talk about uh, China for a minute, because that's uh, I don't know if you could call it a, a refugee situation. It's a situation where the two nations are in a tension. It's a geopolitical thing, you know. It's a competitive thing, economically, militarily. It's a thing where the two the two countries are constraining, if you will, the flow of people, of information, of mm, you know the the general the general um, positive prospect that, that looked like it was going to happen in the early 2000s. And now that's been tightened, constrained. Okay? Um, of course, that has a negative effect on both countries. And I'm sure you and I would agree on that. But how do we deal with people who would like to come here, but can't come here um, because of political constraints? And that, that, of course, would include Hong Kong. I mean, a lot of people would like to come here from Hong Kong too, but they can't do it. Um, what is our role in that regard? Well, let's put us uh, uh, put that in a slightly different perspective, because, you know, as you know, I am hesitant and to to uh, put myself in a, a position I'm not capable of to comment on you know, uh, most sensitive issues. But I do want to mention that we, these country have a history of uh, other, other people. And uh, so that we have to, uh, before the program ends, we have to tackle the, the uh, subtitle of our program, the Deja Wu all over again. So it's, China has been considered um, a strategic partner for a while, and now obviously it's a competitor. And uh, that uh, mentality affected to our immigration policy and our foreign policy. And Justice Anderson gave me a, a fantastic lecture the other day, talk, uh, talk about the history of immigration and refugees in this nation. And uh, from German, or Irish, uh, Catholic, and Chinese, and uh, uh, Muslim, and Japanese, and now Chinese again. So it, there's a why Alexander uh, Professor Morava uh, say that the subtitle of our program should be Deja Wu all over again, which I call Justice Anderson's historical le lesson. There's nothing new in our current debate on immigration and refugee. It's, it has been happened has, uh, in, in the past in history many, many times, and many, many groups have been in turn in turn to be out labeled as other people. And judge, if you are still with us, would you mind to just give us a very concise history about what you've been telling me in, in the past few days? Oh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm coming a little bit here, but I, mean, I want to talk about the very people who are xenophobic now, they were the crowd eaters. They were the dirty Irish. They were the dumb Norwegians, the dumb Swedes. I mean, it's, there's this human need to denigrate various groups, and then they assimilate and then become part of the culture. We're seeing that in Minnesota, where the uh, uh, the Hmong people were ostracized and excluded, and now they're becoming such a part of our culture. I mean, we, we have an Olympic champion, uh, you know, who's part of that culture. And so... There's something that's natural about this whole process. And so uh, when you talk about, I'm going to come back to uh, Bush, I mean, to uh, Biden, he has to use the bully pulpit. I think he can use it with respect to the Afghanis because they have been loyal to us and stood up for us. And, uh, you know, maybe he has to pick and choose his uh, battle sites. But uh, I think he can overcome some of this uh, uh, xenophobia with his bully pulpit and telling uh, how much these people can add and contribute. When you talk about the Chinese, hey, go to Vancouver. See what a thriving community that came after the 1990 turnover of Hong Kong. They took in so many refugees, and it's just invigorated that city, made it a world-class city. Yeah. We're running out of time, uh, Alexander, Professor Morava, and I wanted to ask you a compound, complex question, if you don't mind. 
You the will first, learn for that. Day. <laughs> the first part, you know, we've talked about Joe Biden. We talked about how Donald Trump affected this and how Joe Biden uh, is affecting it and could affect it. But what about the courts in this country? Um, and I suppose I'm thinking about the, um, you know, the, the, the federal courts. Maybe I'm also talking about the immigration courts, um, about what, what they could do to liberalize, to get back to a, a place that is more humane. That's the first part of my question. The second part of my question is, in fact, what's going to happen here? I'd like you to predict, take it all all the things we've been talking about, all the historical and cultural and um, social changes in this country, the direction of the country, the circumstances in the world that affect that. Uh, where are we going on this? What's going to happen? Okay. Can you break it down in two answers? <laughs> I'll try my best. Well, but the first thing with the courts is uh, the setup of the immigration appeals process is very peculiar. Because we have immigration judges, we have a board of immigration appeals, and the next level is the federal courts of appeal. And ultimately, but really, the Supreme Court says something about immigration not very frequently. Uh, the immigration judges that I was familiar with, and actually my law professor who taught me immigration law, became an immigration judge afterwards, were highly committed federal administrative law judges, not full judges in that sense, but in, in, uh, independent adjudicators of those cases who take, took great pains to decide those cases. It seems from what we see in the press nowadays, the immigration appeals process has become a, a rather stamping exercise of denials of asylum. I've seen that in the past in Europe and was that's happened in the 1990s, 2000s and so on, when mass influx of refugees happened. Uh, when you rubber stamp, usually you don't, you don't come up with a sophisticated legal analysis and, and the quality of adjudication deteriorates. And I think we're seeing that in part. Uh, the Biden administration, and that would also include the Attorney General, Mary Garner, uh, would certainly be in a position to step in and, and change that, or at least tilt it in a way that we go back to the previous version. Um, I do not believe, quite frankly, that I can predict the future here. Uh, I think we're currently in a position that we could compare to about 2013 in Europe, where there was a mass influx of 2 million refugees, asylum seekers, refugees of determination. There were people claiming asylum who were quite simply storming the borders and crossing the borders. Uh, they were shipped straight through to countries that would adjudicate their claims. Germany took up a lot of them, and now uh, the political landscape in Germany is very much influenced by the consequence of that action, namely um, increase in xenophobia and hatred towards immigrant communities. And that's not just the ones that actually came in 2015, that's now everybody who is different. So we have another clear instance of othering. I think we are currently in that situation here to a certain extent, exacerbated by not just uh, the former president, uh, but also by many people who were in its orbit, who were, were resounding the same xenophobic message in any way. Um, we can overcome that, but it will take some time. I don't believe we'll simply say, now we have to be humanitarian again, now we have to, you know, Biden fully pulpit might work to a certain extent when it comes to Afghanistan. I don't think it will change our mindset that, again, has a history and has a semi-logical basis now, uh, given the Afghanistan situation, given the Haiti situation and the southern border situation, generally speaking. So a uh, summary of the very long and not very concise uh, statement I was trying to make here, I think we'll need to wait, but we'll, we'll need to take baby steps towards improving the situation of immigrants, generally speaking, by making baby steps towards changing the mindset of the population. It's not going to be a sweeping all, change it all from today to tomorrow, and all of a sudden we'll be opening our arms and saying, come back. Judge uh, Anderson, uh, last comments. Uh, well, would you agree with Alexander? Um, how do you feel about the future? Uh, I'm an optimist. I'm a... Uh, no glasses full of that said, I've never been so discouraged about the future of our country right now as I am. And uh and we're gonna you know, we're gonna go through a, a rather dicey period until we uh, uh come out of it a bit. But I am basically optimistic. I study history and you know the uh, the underlying goodness of the American people I think will finally prevail.
I do want to touch on that little question about, it's not a little question, about judges and how they make decisions. I'm going to be very, you got to elect the right appointing official. You do not change the minds of these judges once they get appointed. They kind of get uh, rigid, whatever. And, uh, you know, they're not bad people. They can uh, build a rationale for how they're making decisions. But you got to have people who say, you know, it's more than just justice. In some ways, doing justice, and you can rationalize it anyway. we got to get people who understand what it is to do the right thing. And it'll be the right thing from a humanitarian point of view. Thank and you. Uh, Thank you. I'm going to be very frank. Hey, elect the right uh, appointing officials and the judiciary will be uh, better. Thank you, Judge. Um, Chang, we're almost out of time. We are out of time. But uh, why don't you close? Well, I have nothing more to add after uh, Judge Justice Anderson and Alexander and you. I just uh, really appreciate the opportunity to revisit this uh, topic. I believe that we, the history will keep replaying itself and we will have this debate on immigration and refugee again and again. But uh, uh, I really appreciate Judge, Judge Anderson's optimism that uh, you, uh, nothing new really uh, in the current debate and uh, we will just uh, going forward as normal, and which depends on which angle you look at the issue. But uh, I will keep yeah. My, yeah. my hope high. Yeah. Your listeners need to understand how enriched we are as a country by the people who come with us and their different backgrounds and experience. It is truly an enriching experience. We've got to figure out how to handle it right. Thank you, Judge Anderson. Thank you, Alexander, Professor Alexander Marava. Uh, and thank you, Chang Wang. We really appreciate it. Uh, talk to you again soon. Aloha. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate